here's a fun group theory challenge, that a group G, no matter what it is, cannot have precisely two elements of order two, where the order of an element is the smallest power of the element that's equal to the identity. So an element is order two if it's not the identity, so it's powered by one is not the identity, but powered by two it is the identity. That's what it means to have order two. So a group cannot have precisely two elements of order two. Very fun exercise, let's dive into it. I'm gonna teach you some fundamental group theory concepts and group theory intuition along the way. I'm a professional mathematician and I do research in group theory. So let's get started. Let's start off with two elements A and B and G and we're going to assume they both have order two, okay? So we know that they're going to be distinct. So we're saying that they're gonna be two elements, A not equal to B, A and B are both not the identity but a squared is the identity and that's equal to b squared, okay? So we're gonna assume for a contradiction that there are precisely two elements of order two and then we're gonna work from there. So how are we going to proceed? So the first trick, and this is a group theory conceptual point, is the idea of an inner automorphism. So I'll explain what this is, okay? It sounds fancy and you may have seen this already, but a quick refresher on what it is. fg of x, okay, is going to equal to g inverse xg. This is a function fg from the group g to itself. So if you fix an element g of the group, little g of the group, then what you do is you get this function from g to itself that is what is conjugation by g. You take g inverse xg for each x, you get another element of the group. Now this is what is called an automorphism because it is an isomorphism from g to itself, which means it is a homomorphism. And we're going to sort of explain this conceptually. It means that fg of xy is equal to fg of x times fg of y. Okay, so this is an important point. That means that the group law is preserved by this function fg. And why is that? Well, the left-hand side is g inverse xyg. And the right-hand side is going to be the following. It's going to be g inverse xg times g inverse yg. And notice something really cool when you have that product is that the g, g inverse cancels, and so you actually just have g inverse x, y, g, which is what is on the left-hand side, so you have an equality there. So this means that it is a homomorphism, and it has an inverse function, okay? Its inverse function is going to be the following. The inverse function is literally f, g inverse, okay? So you conjugate by g inverse. If you conjugate by g inverse, you're going to get g inverse inverse of times x times g inverse, which is just g, x, g inverse. You can see here that if you apply fg inverse followed by f, you get the identity function, okay? So I'm just going to leave that as an exercise. So drop a comment down below why that's true. And that shows fg is an automorphism. And why have I gone through all this? Well, it's a conceptual reason because it basically allows us to produce more elements of order two. Remember, isomorphisms, they preserve group theoretical structure. So if you have an element of order two, such as a, and you conjugate it by some g, you're gonna get another element of order two. Okay, so let's talk about this right now. So to iterate this point precisely in one specific example, we're gonna look at B inverse AB. Okay, so it, this would be true for any G. G inverse AG would be an element of order two. But just let's look at B inverse AB and just reiterate the points we've just studied. Well, B inverse AB is first of all, not equal to E, right? It's not equal to E because if it were equal to E, if B inverse AB were equal to E, that would imply that then multiplying on the left by b, you would get that ab is equal to b, and then that would imply multiplying on the right by b inverse, that therefore a is equal to e, okay, using the group axioms. So a is not the identity, okay? So that's a feature of homomorphisms or, or, or isomorphisms, that if you have a non-identity element, it's mapped to another non-identity element because they're bijective, and the identity is always mapped to the identity. Okay, so they're bijective because they have the inverse. Now, the other point though, is that B inverse AB has the same structural properties as A. B inverse AB squared is just going to equal to B inverse A squared B. You can square A and then take the conjugate by B, or you can take the conjugate of A by B and then take its square. So in other words, B inverse AB squared, if you just write it out, it's B inverse AB times B inverse AB. So we're seeing the same calculation we just saw, and we're just gonna get B inverse A squared B. Okay, so what that means is because A squared is the identity, remember A as order two, that means this is just B inverse times identity times B, which is of course just the identity by the definition of inverse. So therefore B inverse AB is also an element of order two. Now we didn't have to go through this. It's a formal consequence of the fact the conjugation by any element is always an automorphism, okay? So you could argue that way, but I just reiterated the point for clarity. And now we're almost at the end of the proof because we've got another element of order two. Is it really another element though? 
I mean, it has to be either A or B, right? We've assumed that these are the only two elements of order two. So how do we now proceed to find out some other element of order two? Let's go on like this. Before I make the big reveal, if you're enjoying my content so far, please don't forget to smash that like button right now and subscribe to the channel. It makes a huge difference for the algorithm to recommend my content to people all over YouTube, learning group theory, want to get into this kind of advanced math, made easy for everyone. And if you're enjoying my content a lot, also please consider checking out the link in the description to my Patreon. It makes a huge difference, all the support I get over there, because I do everything on my own. And as a big thank you for all the supporters, huge thank you so much to Alex, Nathan, and Trang. But thank you to everyone who supports. I have a members-only Discord server there, exclusive access to news and updates about my channel, priority reply to YouTube comments, and a personalized thank you message. So I make sure to really thank everyone. I'm very grateful for all the support there. And it, even small contributions really drive the channel forward. So let's now get to understanding how do we produce another element of order two. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider the following element, B inverse AB. We understood it as order two just now. And we also know the following. It is not going to be equal to B. Okay, why is it not equal to B? Well, if it was equal to B, okay? So if B inverse AB was equal to B, then what we could do is we could multiply both sides on the right by B inverse. So we would then get that B inverse A is going to equal to E, right? You're just canceling B on the right in a group. And then if you multiply both sides on the left by B, you're just going to get A is equal to B, okay? Which we know is a contradiction, okay? We know that A and B were distinct elements. So therefore what we know, I'm just going to erase this. Therefore we know that therefore B inverse AB is going to equal to A, right? because there are only two elements of order two. It has to be one of them. But now we get somewhere interesting. If we multiply on the left by B on both sides, we get AB is equal to BA. And this is actually a very important point that the elements of the group fixed by conjugation by B, right? So A is getting mapped to A under this function. Those elements are just the elements that commute with B, okay? So if you fix your B and you find B inverse AB is A, that just means that A and B commute. AB is equal to BA. And why is that cool? Because now we're almost done. Now we can then therefore say that, what about AB? Now this is a general, this is specific to this proof. AB now has order two. Because what you can do is you can write AB times AB, and then using the fact that associativity holds in the group and B and A commute, you can swap them around. This is not always true, okay? It's not always true that, for example, drop a comment down below, two matrices A and B, Okay, two matrices, just examples of matrices. They both have order two. They're both square to be the identity, but their product is not square to be the identity. Can you find two such examples? If they don't commute, it's possible. Okay, so here they commute, so we can just write this as A squared times B squared, just swapping the B and A, and that's of course just going to be the identity because A and B have order two. So now we've got that AB has order two, and now that is a contradiction. And why is that a contradiction? So I'll write that right now. It is a contradiction because AB is not equal to A, right? Because if AB was equal to A, what would happen? Okay, I just drop a comment down below. Think about that, it's an exercise. AB is not equal to A, and AB is also not equal to B. Okay, so why is that true? So that's my challenge to you, my quick sort of exercise to you. I reply to every comment, you know, I reply to every comment on my channel since inception, except troll comments. I really care about everyone, value everyone who writes, who watches the videos, you know, it makes, makes a huge difference to the channel and I'm really grateful for the support and I really appreciate the interest. I love helping people. So drop a comment down below and you see that AB has order two, it's not equal to A and B and that's our contradiction. So therefore a group cannot have precisely two elements of order two. Now I'm gonna leave you with two observations. You can have one element of order two because for example, a cyclic group of order two, okay? And you can also have three elements of order two, okay? So here's an example of such a group. So for three elements of order two, it's a very important group. It's, it's worth knowing, you know, if you haven't seen it, you know, it's one of the earliest groups in group theory. It's called the Klein four group V4, E, A, B, and C. And basically the group law is very simple. The product of any two non-identity elements is the third. It doesn't matter what order you do it. So it's an abelian group. So for example, A, B is defined to be C, B, A is defined to be C. If I multiply A and C, that's B, and so on and so forth, okay? And finally, each element squares to be the identity. A squared is E is equal to B squared is equal to C squared, okay? So, and the identity multiplied by anything is that thing. This is the Klein four group. It has three elements of order two. Can you prove that a group can't have four elements of order two? What about an even number of elements of order two? Can you think about that? Drop a comment down below, it's a challenge. Okay, I'm interested to hear what your answer is. I have two fun videos for you. 
The first is a really crazy group theory riddle, a mind bender. It basically asks that if you have a group where there do not exist three elements, no two of which commute, what does that mean? We have to think about that. You can prove the group is abelian. I've dissected that in this video here. And another fun video, a little bit left field, is the most beautiful math proof I think I've seen as a professional mathematician. The proof that a fundamental property of least common multiples of numbers in number theory using integral calculus. Check it out here. Wish you all the best. I'll catch you in either of those two videos. Have a great day.